Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Contagion Cultures webinar. It's Tuesday, December 1st. We are broadcasting from the traditional territories of the Ashinaabe and Haudenosaunee. Queen's University was inaugurated here in 1841 by Queen Victoria. Thus, this Institute of Higher Learning that aims to further Canada and the world in a plethora of ways is also an imperial project. I'm grateful to learn here and work here. I need to remember this history and strive to right wrongs against Indigenous and many other peoples that continue to this day. Of course, we know that this will be quite a thorny, uh, thorny task, um, and I, I, I really wonder where it will lead us and how we'll get there. It feels like one of the bigger challenges that we have um, even today in these, um, in these COVID times. I hope that this series, which aims to incorporate and further various ways of thinking about how to best live with all of the planet, does work in this direction in some small way. Contagion Cultures is a Faculty of Arts and Science collaboration between the School of Policy Studies and Languages, Literatures and Cultures, the departments that I'm in, also Cultural Studies and Gender Studies and Film and Media. And Queen's Library is supporting, uh, supporting us substantively by archiving the, uh, the talks. Hopefully people who are teaching will use them in the future. And obviously they'll be there then uh, for people to, to watch. In the, we're, we're gonna continue this series into the winter. Through the winter, we'll take a break during, at the end of the year and the beginning of the new year. And then when classes start, we'll be starting again. And we'll be widening the circle to showcase our fabulous Queens graduate students who'll be doing the moderating for the speakers who will be faculty members of Queens as usual. We hope that you will pre-register, you'll invite people that you know that would be interested and just uh, disseminate promotional materials widely. Queen's Contagion Cultures Lectures helps to make sense of this pandemic through the expertise and insights of arts and science, arts and science faculty members. This public facing series leverages the powerful tools of humanistic analysis to grapple with our turbulent times. For the audience, there are Q&A at the bottom and you can find it in the middle of your screen by hovering if you can't see it right now. As webinar attendees, you are invisible and muted, but we welcome your typed questions for the end after around a 40 minute talk by our fabulous speaker, Dr. Carolyn Kraus and geography. She's an assistant professor and Queens National Scholar and in the Department of Geography and Planning. Her scholarly work unpacks practices of urban economic development. It builds relationships between global and anti-decolonial urbanism, critical development studies, health sociology, and critical race feminist geographies. She has conducted extensive research on favela urbanization in Rio and is currently working a project concer concerned with human milk banking infrastructure and with new biosecurity projects. Her talk today, which promises to be fabulously interesting, is called Precarious Intimacies in the Microbiological City. Thank you. Carolyn. Okay, thank you, Jen. Let me just share my screen here. Oh, and make sure I'm on the right slide before I share it with you. Um, so thank you for hosting this series. Thank you everyone who is here. I know this is a really busy time of year, so I appreciate the time you've taken to be here with us. Um, let me just go ahead and share this. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, especially Jen, for all the work you've done with organizing. I know that has involved chasing people down uh, for abstracts like myself. So thank you for, for all the work that you have done. I think Warren maybe has also been part of the organization here and Chris Cornish, thank you to them. Um, so I think this is a wonderful and timely series. And I think it's part of what we should be doing as academics using our disciplines and our disciplinary thought uh, to try to understand what's going on in our worlds. And so today that is partly the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you for hosting this series. I also wanna thank my 400 level undergrad seminar class uh, that has been focused on the topic of pandemic urbanism. So we've been thinking through a lot of these ideas over the course of the term. And so some of the things that I'll share with you today are very much a function of the conversations that we've had in that class. So as Jen said, my name is Carolyn Prouse. I'm a human geographer. And what that means is that I take a social science approach to understanding space and place. And most of my work focuses on cities and urbanization processes. So what I want to think a little bit more about with you today 
is how urbanization, and by that I mean the growth of cities and the increasing centrality of cities to the global economy, so how this urbanization is driving zoonotic disease emergence and transmission, and how cities and the urban fringe are increasingly the site of prevention and control with what I think are both promising and potentially dangerous outcomes. And I'm gonna do this through the lens of urban political ecology, which I will explain. So I first became interested in non-human disease vectors during some of my dissertation work in Brazil. And this was in the lead up to Brazil hosting the 2014 World Cup and Rio de Janeiro hosting the 2016 Olympic Games. So in the months prior to the games, more than 100 health experts wrote an open letter to the World Health Organization urging that the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games must be postponed, moved, or both as a precautionary concession in the name of public health. Their concern was a microscopic entity that was having global reverberations. And this, of course, was the Zika virus carried by the 80s Egypti mosquito which was linked to abnormal brain development in fetuses. And this is a condition called microcephaly. Ultimately, the games went ahead, but the Olympic organizing committee and the IOC wouldn't let them falter, but they did issue some cautions to tourists. They told tourists to stay in their air conditioned hotel rooms and to stay out of quote, areas and towns with no piped water or poor sanitation. So namely the, the city's favelas, which are informal settlements that, that are on the hills of Rio de Janeiro. So I became interested in the urban politics of this decision, um, specifically thinking about how the mosquito can be thought of as an agent that shapes urbanization dynamics and governance efforts, but whose agency is tied up in the power, profit, and political dynamics of mega events, and I argue um, broader capitalist endeavors. So I began to think through how the urban or the city is a socio-natural. It's never simply natural or simply social, uh, but it's a hybrid entity that shapes the mosquitoes and therefore the viruses, travels, and breeding grounds, therefore creating new precarious intimacies between mosquitoes, viruses, and people. But I also wanted to know who specifically was being made precarious. So as the IOC warning hints at, not everyone is similarly affected and protected. It was racialized cariocas in low-income communities that were being exposed to this disease while tourists were protected behind their windows with their air conditioning in their hotel rooms. And so questions, broader questions of zoonotic disease have become an urgent global focal point. So zoonotic diseases refer to those viruses and bacteria that are transmitted from animals to humans and have harmful effects on humans. They include HIV AIDS, SARS, MERS, avian flu, and of course, COVID-19. Zoonosis has been of increasing concern to the global public health establishment over the last two decades, but this concern has reached a fever pitch due to the COVID pandemic. And there are a number of factors that scientists and urban planners, the WHO governments link to this increased rate of zoonotic disease emergence. And one of those is the urban. Um, and that's what I wanna talk a little bit about today. So what I'm gonna do in this brief presentation is to think about the city as a more than human space that is shaped by colonial capitalist processes that create new precarious intimacies between infectious disease agents like microbes um, and particular people. And I'm going to do this by thinking through the lens of urban political ecology. And then I'll discuss three different temporal moments in which the urban is intimately wrapped in, up in zoonotic disease. And so I'm gonna think through emergence, transmission and prevention. So to think of precarious intimacies, I find the lens of urban political ecology useful. So UPE tries to upset this nature culture, culture dualism that is often inherent to Eurocentric Western thought. So um, within this way of knowing the world, uh, it often enacts a Cartesian dualism, which separates nature from culture, separates the material world from the social world. Um, and this dualism is wrapped up in racialization processes that cast some people as less than human for the pursuit of profit. Uh, and scholars often call this racial capitalism or colonial capitalism. And nature is taken as a raw resource that is exploitable and commodified to fuel capitalism. Um, and what a lot of scholars argue is that this binary exists both in thought, so it's how many people think of the world, perceive and interact with the world, um, but it's also a binary that is materially enacted through social relations of racial capitalism that casts some people and some nature as inherently exploitable 
Uh, and within this binary, cities are often thought of as being the height of civilization, the height of social worlds. Um, and so cities are often cast as being inherently social spaces. So urban political ecology has emerged as a discipline or as an interdiscipline that tries to upset this dualism. UPE sees urbanization as occurring within, quote, a vast network of relations and within complex flows of energy and matter as capital, commodities, people, and ideas that link urban natures with distant site and distant ecologies. So the urban here is an ecology, but it is a political ecology. So it's one that is shaped by intersecting relations of power. Of course, there are many intellectual traditions and cosmologies that have long theorized places as more than human environments in ways that don't operate within Western dualist thinking. I'm thinking here of indigenous cosmologies and different black cosmologies. And I believe Sammy King in her Contagion Culture Lecture spoke to some of these other ways of, of knowing the world. Um, so I urge you to look at that, that uh, lecture as well. Today, I'm gonna to focus a little bit more on kind of the Marxist orientation of UPE because this discipline has very much Marxist roots. So this discipline arose primarily from Marxist scholars who were looking to understand how capitalist processes create urban ecologies. Um, so how like urban environments, which include mosquitoes and viruses. So in their line of thought, nature is produced through human labor that acts on and shapes the world. So human labor and capitalist relations create what these scholars call socio-natures or hybrid cities. Following this approach, there's nothing inherently natural about a city park, for instance. It is often enclosed, it is often zoned and has a legal infrastructure that makes it a park. It is groomed and it is maintained uh, by, by people. Uh, so parks themselves are socio-natures, even though many people tend to think of them as nature. Likewise, there is nothing inherently social about a concrete apartment building or about Grant Hall at Queen's University. Um, the rock has been quarried in a colonial form of extraction, sometimes from Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory. It has been shaped by human labor and financial investment in Queen's as an institution. So Grant Hall is a, a necessarily socio-natural entity. It can't be teased apart as either social or natural. So what I'm particularly interested in here with respect to zoonotic disease is how colonial capitalist development, so I mean, thinking of, of for-profit development that often disadvantages and exploits lower income racialized populations, how this colonial capitalist development creates and reorganizes socio-natures. So how, for instance, mosquitoes congregate in pools of stagnant water left when buildings are not finished because they are no longer lucrative to build. Um, or how the growth of cities pushes more and more people to the urban fringe, placing them potentially in new contact with wildlife and disease agents. So in some urban political ecology looks at how the urban and processes that transform the urban recreate and reorganize human, plant, animal, and microbial environments. And following UPE scholars of racial capitalism, I'm interested in how intersecting lines of racialized, class, gendered, and sexualized power shape these urbanizing socio-natures, creating new precarious intimacies. And crucially here, people are not distinct entities separate from the natural world, um, but we are part of urban ecologies. And so we carry urban ecologies, those of us who live in cities, um, carry urban ecologies within us in the foods and waters we eat and drink, um, in the networks of microbes that move in and out of us, uh, the vast majority of which are actually beneficial to us and our, our functioning. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna now take this lens of urban ecology and thinking about the city and urbanization processes as socio-natures. I'm gonna take that lens and look at three different temporal moments of infectious disease in which the urban figures prominently. Um, in other words, I'm gonna think of how colonial capitalist urbanization processes reshape ecologies that create new precarious intimacies. So first I wanna think of how these processes um, of colonial capitalism have increased the risk of zoonotic disease, what is often called, a, called spillover. So that movement of, of an infectious agent from an animal to a human. Um, and the term emergence is often used to denote this. Emergence is a little bit more of an all encompassing term with respect to infectious disease, but it's often used to denote the spillover moment. Um, and emergence designates when an infectious disease uh, takes hold in an area where it previously was not endemic or present. 
And so you may have seen the acronym EID, Emerging Infectious Disease, proliferating in the news media and by organizations like the WHO. And these are the diseases that are becoming increasingly targeted by biosecurity measures, which I'll talk about in the second half of the presentation. So there are a number of different ways in which the urban as a socio-natural process is implicated in emerging infectious diseases, um, specifically zoonotic diseases. So how the urban, urban is remaking ecologies in power-laden ways. And you will no doubt have encountered many of these in popular discourses surrounding COVID. So I'm not gonna to speak to all of them at length, um, but it would re be remiss to not mention widespread urbanization and urban encroachment. So many of you have heard that the majority of the world now lives in cities, the majority of the world's population. Um, there has been unprecedented growth in mega cities and mega regions, which means the cities themselves are growing and people living on the urban fringes are growing. Uh, and this is encroaching into territory that has previously had less human presence. Um, and therefore many, many are arguing, many scientists are arguing that this increases the risk of zoonotic crossover. Um, I sometimes worry that this discourse actually enacts a terra nullius ideology, that there were never humans present in some of these places, which I don't think is true. Um, but we can talk a little bit more about that in the question and answer session. The growth in cities and urban populations has also seen uh, simultaneous growth in industrialized agriculture, generally to feed many urban citizens. This results also in different kinds of encroachment into um, non-human centered territory. So we see whole ecosystems being torn down for monocrop production like soy and corn and for livestock like cows. And this displaces animals in these ecosystems to often nearby human inhabited areas, therefore increasing risk of, of potential contacts. Um, and of course, industrial animal farming has become disease reservoirs. Um, there's spaces where bacteria and viruses are able to exchange a lot of genetic material with potentially um, very lethal, making lethal combinations or lethal to human health combinations. Uh, and these conditions also favor antibiotic resistant bacteria because of the widespread use of antibiotics in these spaces. Many scholars and scientists argue that ecotourism is increasing. So urban citizens from generally the north are going to more rural locations in the south and engaging in activities like bat caving. And there's also increased climate footprint of the urban and of the suburban, which is, which is changing the climate and warming the climate. So increased reliance on cars in the suburbs, the global economy's reliance on people and goods flying between global cities has contributed to this warming. And with warming, we see the territory of different animals changing. So for the Aedes aegypti mosquito, for instance, they're very sensitive to a temperature difference of one or two degrees Celsius. So with an increase in one or two degrees Celsius, many scientists argue that the, the Aedes aegypti mosquito is able to inhabit a much larger temperate zone. It's also hypothesized that the 2010 outbreak of West Nile virus in Greece was probably caused by birds deviating from their typical migratory route because of the warming climate. So they were going into the areas where West Nile virus had not previously or historically been. Some scientists have argued that the warming climate has also increased the territory of ticks, which is a growing concern in Kingston in this particular area. Um, ticks can carry a variety of microbes that are harmful to humans. Uh, so climate change has been implicated with the increased, increased area that ticks inhabit, um, but also socio-natural changes in the urban environment are implicated in ticks proliferation in these areas. So some scientists are arguing that suburbanization has actually decreased biodiversity and favors the tick. Uh, and that is because suburbanization actually changes quite complex ecosystems and overlays them or basically upends them and creates very monotonous kind of lawns and uh, hedges and houses that favor things like, like the white the white footed mice and uh, white tailed deer. It doesn't favor the predators of these animals. So foxes, weasels, owls, and hawks. So in suburbs, especially in North America um, and in Canada, we see an overabundance then of mice and white-tailed deer that, that ticks love, that harbor ticks, and that also are disease reservoirs for Lyme disease. Um, so in these areas, we've seen an increase in both ticks and Lyme disease because of the changing socio-natures of, of the suburbs, the changing ecologies and decreased biodiversity of those suburbs. 
there has also been with COVID especially a lot of media attention as to how different people's food sources are linked to zoonotic disease. Uh, and we can see this in the racialized origin stories of COVID and this idea of animal traffic um, being linked to disease emergence. But taking a political ecology approach to food sourcing, we can tease apart some of the broader dynamics that have led some communities to rely on what is often thought of as dangerous meat. Um, and we can see some of the shifting neo-colonial relations that bring people into potentially closer contact or more, um, more potentially dangerous contact with disease causing vectors. And so in an article in the journal Science, um, this or an article documented how in West Africa, more and more people are relying on bush meat, which I think is it's a fairly racialized moniker, but we can talk about that later. Um, and this bush meat itself is actually a generic term that refers to over 400 different species of terrestrial vertebrates. Um, but the bush meat trade in West Africa is often said to be growing quite significantly. West Africa has seen massive city growth um, and this growth has driven an increased demand for animal protein uh, that many link to the increased or increasingly extensive bush meat trade. But as political ecologists and as geographers, we ask, well, why is this happening? So traditionally, West Africans have eaten fish as the principal source of protein. And fishing has been a major industry that employs nearly a quarter of some of the workforce in some African, West African countries. Um, but over the last several decades, local boats from West African countries have been unable to compete with some of the modern government subsidized fleets that are coming from Europe and increasingly from China that now trawl the Gulf of Guinea. And according to this science article, these fleets are, quote, illegally extracting fish of the highest commercial value while dumping 70 to 90 percent of their haul as bycatch. So what this has meant is that fish biomass in the Gulf of Guinea has fallen by at least half since 1977. This has resulted in more scarcity of fish and increasingly expensive fish. Uh, and so many argue, or this article argues, that many have increasingly turned to bush meat in order to, um, for a new kind of animal protein. And so now there's approximately 400,000 tons of wild game annually caught in West Africa, resulting in, quote, this radically increased biological contact between humans and wild animals. And many scientists point to HIV AIDS as originating from this increased contact between chimpanzees and, ham and humans in Southeast Cameroon. Um, but this is debated in the literature. Um, there is debates as to whether HIV AIDS even originated on the continent of Africa. And um, these origin stories tend to be hyper-racialized. Um, I'm not an expert in those debates, um, but I think even if we, we take this increased contact between humans and animals as increasing zoonotic disease, we have to, as, as geographers, as political ecologists, think, trace why these increased contacts why these contacts have been occurring um, and trace them to these broader forces that are shaping diets and shaping food sources and, sh and shaping employment, um, employment opportunities. Uh, and so here we see how other countries, countries from Europe and, and China are depleting fish sources in what I would argue is a fairly neo-colonial manner. So overall, um, when we're thinking about disease emergence, especially zoonotic disease emergence, we can trace this or, the, or many scientists and, and public health officials are tracing this to changing urban dynamics, to urban encroachment, to decreasing biodiversity and to shifting food sources that are all changing socio-natural environments uh, and are creating these new potentials for precarious and prolonged contact between people and animals who have heretofore often had some contact, but maybe not necessarily as much contact. Of course, urbanization dynamics are not just related to the emergence of infectious disease, but also to how disease moves between people. This is commonly referred to as transmission. Um, and so it's interesting to think about the differences between these terms as well, emergence and transmission, and the different sort of um, anthropomorphic ideologies that underpin those terms, which we can talk about also in the question and answer period. Um, but anyway, for the purposes of today, I'll just call this transmission. So we can think about how the urban and urbanization processes shape socio-natural environments that favor or disfavor transmission at both the macro scale. And so here I'm thinking about connections between different urban environments, between different cities. And we can also think about it within the city itself. And so I'll briefly look at each. So at a more macro scale, we can think about how the new international division of labor has changed the relationships between cities. 
So since the 70s and 80s, we have seen a growth in the centrality of global cities, um, cities like London, Singapore, Beijing, New York, which in um, world cities theory are often seen as the drivers of the global economy. They are the information financialized centers of the, of the world. Uh, and, and they are hyper-connected, hyper-connected by goods and information, but also by people and people's ecologies that travel between these centers. And we both um, elite business people, um, but also laborers and lower income laborers and, and, and family members who travel between these cities, carrying their bodily ecologies with them. And so Rajay Kyle, who is a geographer at York University, he argues that the 2003 SARS pandemic clearly followed this route of flow between global cities, specifically in Asia, but also between those cities and Toronto. So Beijing, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Toronto, and, and connections between those were implicated in the spread of SARS. The new International Division of Labor is also involved in bringing precarious laborers to cities to work. And so we see this with, um, for instance, Haitian asylum seekers working on the front lines in elder care homes in, in Montreal. And we see the movement of, of workers from the Caribbean and from Jamaica and from Mexico coming to Southwestern Ontario to work on farms, to feed again, often a growing urban population in, in Canada. Um, and these have been sites and hotbeds of disease outbreaks. So earlier this summer, two temporary foreign workers from Mexico died in Southwestern Ontario as part of, of, of our globalized food system. So this new international division of labor that sees the movement of people is central to understanding the different, how disease moves, but also the different kinds of precarities and, and how people are made precarious within these systems. There's also been an increasing suburbanization of the world. This has happened due to a number of different dynamics. Um, many scholars, urbanists in North America trace the, the development of suburbs, suburbs to post-war economies in North America and concomitant kinds of white flight. Um, but we're seeing the growth of suburbs all over the world due partly to land grabs that are forcing people who have historically lived in rural places going to, to the cities to try and find work. Um, so land grabs, industrialized agriculture, um, climate change is, is forcing rural to urban migration. And there's also been expanded production networks where with the new international division of labor, the firm itself has vertically disintegrated. It has kind of exploded its operations. And now a lot of production facilities are locating themselves in suburbs with access to lower income labor. And this is facilitating new, facilitating new kinds of interconnections and new kinds of, of disease transmission. And so um, the same, so Rajay Kyle, the geographer Rajay Kyle, along with his colleagues, Creighton Connolly and Harris Ali, explain that the early movements of COVID followed this partly the suburb to suburb connections. So some of the early cases in Germany um, were relationships or were wrought through relationships between a auto parts company in Wabasto, which is near Munich, um, and an automobile company in a Wuhan suburb. So these new suburban interconnections are also important, not just global city interconnections. Of course, these interconnections are facilitated by an increasingly globalized infrastructure of airplanes, airports, um, highways uh, that facilitate the movement of people at, at, at very fast rates. So there's been time space compression. Um, and then also rural to urban migration has, as I spoke about with suburbanization, has been a, an important factor in how cities have grown, but also create concerns around how people might move move disease or move their own bodily ecologies. So for instance, in the early days of COVID in Indonesia, there was a lot of concern of people who had migrated to the urban centers for work, going back home to see their family or for religious kinds of festivals and observances, and therefore potentially spreading COVID um, quite broadly through the country. So that's thinking about kind of the relationships between different cities, between different suburbs and between the rural and the urban. Of course, we can look within the city itself. Uh, many of you will be familiar with these, so I won't go into much depth, but there are many urban dynamics within cities that shape differential transmission. It's a lack of affordable housing leading to dense living conditions where it's impossible to socially isolate or not, not having affordable housing for people who now live on the street or have to exist in shelters that um, are not, not safe generally for many people, and especially during COVID people having to work on the front lines, still have to go to work. Many people in lower income suburbs, including in Toronto, 
don't get paid sick leave, so they still have to go to work even when they are sick, um, and they need to take public transit to work. And so these, these are all socio-natural factors that facilitate the movement of viruses among particular populations. But a little bit more abstractly, following a UPE approach, we can also think about how capital moves through the environment and creates new socio-natural spaces that impact people's precarities. Um, in other words, thinking of how large capital investments shift, actually shift the flows of people, water, vectors, and policy in ways that make already precarious people more susceptible to infectious disease. So by way of example, I'm going to take you back to Rio um, and the lead up to the World Cup and the Olympics, which I started this presentation speaking about. So Rio de Janeiro at the time had a really progressive slum upgrading project or favela urbanization project. It was called Morar Carioca. It was a municipal program that Mariana Cavalcanti calls an urban planner's dream. So this municipal program was centered on full community participation, integrated service delivery, and a large part of this program was focused on this infrastructural upgrading of informal settlements, um, many of which prioritized sanitation infrastructure. So this program, had it been rolled out everywhere, it would have vastly decreased the um, presence of water, of pools of water, and therefore diminished the breeding grounds of the Aedes aegypti mosquito, and therefore decreased the, um, the movement of the virus. But this project was largely disbanded by former or then mayor of Rio, Eduardo Pais, uh, for the immediate capital and spatial requirements of the FIFA World Cup and Olympic Games. In other words, this policy to upgrade the infrastructure of low income racialized favelas was displaced for capital investments in stadium and transportation infrastructure. So the sport mega events compounded already in existing infrastructural neglect that has allowed the mosquitoes and, and some of the microbes they carry to flourish. At the same time, the sport mega events were directly involved in the displacement of people. So cariocas were actively displaced from their homes and communities adjacent to stadium infrastructure. They were relocated to, or they had to find new accommodation in areas of poor infrastructure that um, had a substantial presence of Aedes aegypti mosquito. And Brazilian scholars at the time estimated that over 50,000 people were forced to move from informal, informal settlements in areas with reasonable infrastructure, because some favelas have quite, reason, have quite good infrastructure, but they were forced to move from, from those areas to the outskirts of cities um, and central settlements that favored the proliferation of this mosquito, um, which is a vector for not only Zika, but also for dengue and chikungunya viruses. So here we see how the movement of capital and people through the environment also changes the socio nature of cities and where the mosquito can go, um, exposing people to harm. And what the UBE approach compels us to look at is how histories of colonial development are often the precondition for this movement. So it's not simply ad hoc, but makes more vulnerable those people whose lives have long been precarious in the city. And this is a point that Queen's geographer Audrey Kobayashi recently made in an op-ed for the Globe and Mail. And in this op-ed, she argues that historical colonial development is again, a precondition for how diseases spread, but also for present day differential access to public health services in the COVID pandemic. Um, and in this op-ed, she's speaking specifically about her experiences in Vancouver's downtown east side, uh, but we can see similar dynamics at work in Toronto where high COVID prevalence, as you can see in this map, um, maps very neatly onto racialized lower income suburbs uh, and in Rio, where Zika was mapped onto racialized lower income favelas and also to lower income raci uh, racialized cities in the northeast of Brazil. Okay, so thus far I've thought a little bit about this idea or this moment of emergence and this moment of transmission, but for the remainder of the presentation I'm going to focus in on a, another temporal moment, thinking about urban prevention strategies. Um, and there are two different ways of urban prevention that I'm thinking of here. I mean, there are multiple ways, but I'm going to just focus on two types of prevention. So the first is a new global apparatus of biosecurity, which is trying to prevent zoonotic disease emergence. So trying to prevent the movement of microbes from animals to humans. Uh, and the second that I'll think a little bit about are community centered prevention efforts that are focused on trying to prevent transmission between people. So 
First, thinking a little bit about biosecurity, um, the World Health Organization, the UN Environment Program, and USAID, among others, have been at the forefront of what are called biosecurity projects. And these projects try to monitor, surveil, and control human and animal populations in order to, among other things, prevent the spillover of infectious disease, particularly in urban areas, dense informal neighborhoods in cities in the global south, um, people living on urban fringes and in, in rural settings. So for example, USAID and UC Davis together created the Pandemic Preparedness for Global Health Security Predict project almost 20 years ago. Incidentally, this program was supposed to finish this year, um, but it had got a six month extension because of COVID. Um, so the Trump administration has actually dealt with biosecurity in quite a different way than Obama and Bush, which we can talk about also in the question and answer period. Um, but workers from this project had been in Nepal since 2004, and what they were doing there was they were trapping, collecting, and testing rodents in urban slums in Kathmandu uh, to see what these rats were carrying. They were asking low-income residents, generally women, to set traps in their homes, and then program workers would come and collect the rats, they would suit up in their PPE and test the rats, and then enter this information into PREDICT's database of infectious disease in hopes of tracking potential disease outbreaks. There's also an emerging profession of virus hunters who are traveling to more rural settings to monitor this idea of the human animal interface. So for instance, they're going to areas, forested areas or areas of the jungle uh, where humans might come upon prime bats or primates. The hunters collect these animals, they test them and then often release them back into the wild. And like their predict partners, they often enter this disease into online databases that map where the threats exist. So these online databases themselves are proliferating and I'd be in, I'm interested in mapping the mappers here. Um, but one of the ways that these actual virus hunters and people doing on the ground work go about their job is they often go onto the land or into the forest with people who hunt for their livelihoods. So again, those people who are often living in impoverished rural communities, who've had to shift their food sources because of these neo-colonial kinds of pressures. Um, and the virus hunters would track the meat that those, those, um, those hunters collect. And in some cases, the virus hunters are actually trying to change the practices of these laborers in order to make them safer. And so on the surface, this all sounds potentially really good. And I find it, it can sometimes be difficult to argue against measures that might prevent illness and death when there's so much of it around us. Um, but I think these programs pose important questions when we think of them as part of this broader apparatus of biosecurity. So I'll just take a second. This is a little bit theoretical, but I'll take a second to think through this. Um, so what is biosecurity? This term is used by academics, policymakers, and scientists to designate programs and projects that manage biological threats. And these can include zoonotic, foodborne, and infectious disease, generally emerging, but not always. Um, they're concerned with bioterrorism, so the use of airborne viruses as weapons, and they're concerned with invasive species. And biosecurity strategies are based on a particular temporal logic of prediction and preemption. So how to secure that, which may not yet exist at the same time as securing already existing life. And I would argue some life, not all life. So as many of us know, infectious disease control has long been wrapped up in colonial and empire expanding projects. Um, public health has always been a concern within, within colonial enterprises, although not often called public health. Uh, but since the 2000s, the biosecurity apparatus has taken on heightened global importance and has a significant financial investment in it. In 2000, for instance, the WHO declared that infectious disease is, quote, a deadlier threat than war. And managing bio threats and emerging disease has increasingly been treated like a war. Uh, with infectious disease units incorporated into military security projects in the United States and therefore in the areas that they imperially had presence in. Um, and this was especially the case under the Bush administration after 9-11. And um, yeah, we can talk more about that as well. Um, but crucially, Melinda Cooper, who's a scholar of biocapital, argues that these human biosecurity discourses and practices displace insecurity and its affective equivalent fear from the structural violence of free market e economics to the transversal movements of people, viruses, and biological agents of all kinds. So what I think she means by this is that viruses, bacteria, and generally racialized people are increasingly managed and controlled through these biosecurity projects 
rather than targeting the political, economic, and socio-ecological forces that influence zoonotic disease emergence, such as what I've already discussed, urbanization, wildlife encroachment, decreased biodiversity, poor sanitation, infrastructure, um, these conditions that make diseases that emerge and proliferate. So in other words, these biosecurity projects can amount to a technological, biomedical, or surveillance fix and don't attend to the power-laden political ecologies that cause disease emergence. They're often trying to remake very local ecologies without thinking about the connections and powerful interrelations between different places and different social natures and those relations with um, capitalist, colonial kinds of imperial projects. Biosecurity also has a geographic and temporal logic, tends to focus on the global south, and especially with respect to zoonotic diseases. Um, and poorer communities, both in dense informal settlements and on the fringes of the urban. And it sees these spaces as sites of potential future risk and therefore as sites of control, surveillance and containment. And so this geographically positions particular places as inherently threatening, of course, leaving open the door and for and supporting a whole range of discriminatory racist practices uh, that locate fear and anxiety in some people. Um, but it also, I think, very dangerously occurs with, in a temporally preemptive way. Um, so the biosecurity logic is that there might not be anything emerging yet, but the fact that it could emerge and prove a threat helps legitimate and justify all of these kinds of surveillance measures. But biosecurity isn't the only kind of prevention effort happening in urban centers throughout the globe. Um, and there's been considerable attention to community-centered kinds of prevention and mutual aid that try to, to prevent urban transmission. And so this very last part of my presentation will focus on this. So in a recent piece for Society and Space, um, four geographers slash anthropologists have recently written that, quote, the pandemic has not, as is sometimes inferred in recent commentary, made residents newly vulnerable. The urban majority has always been vulnerable a condition which has deepened over the past decades. What the pandemic has done is profoundly erode the arrangements they create and recreate, these ways of getting by, these forms of collective life, thereby leaving neighborhoods and individuals alike with the need to rapidly rearrange already tenuous and plural processes. So in this longer article, what these scholars argue is that in informal settlements in the global south, and I would also say in many places and communities in the north, Mobility is central to how low-income racialized populations make life. Moving to jobs, moving in and out of family and friends' houses for shelter, moving to multiple places to find money and buy food. Um, and these mobilities are relational and they are collective. People have long had to work together to make life. Uh, pandemic lockdowns have tried to circumscribe this collective life. So governments calling for people to socially distance, for people to isolate, um, has actually criminalized some of the behavior that has been necessary for life. It criminalizes this mobility that, um, that, that is necessary for people to, to meet their basic needs. What Bon Atel argue is that, um, that there have long been these existing networks, these existing socio-ecologies of collective life that are being circumscribed and undermined by COVID, by stay-at-home orders, but these networks and collectivities are also being reshaped to meet the needs of people living under COVID conditions. And we see this in the form of mutual aid groups that are cropping up all over the globe um, that are trying to prevent COVID transmission. These community-based kinds of prevention that are growing out of already existing relationships and collectivities. And so this is happening in Rio's favelas, for, exa for example, uh, in Complexo do Mare, uh, there have been a number of different mutual aid collectivities. Uh, so this particular complex of favelas has 16 favelas. It has over 140,000 people living in it. Uh, and when COVID struck, a longtime Mare activist named Giselle Machines, she co-founded Mare Mobilization Front against COVID-19. And what this group is trying to do is spread accurate information about COVID in the face of the federal government's disinformation campaigns. Um, and they are delivering food to residents, especially vulnerable elderly residents, uh, so they don't need to leave their own homes. Uh, this mobilization front has already reached, actually this, this was months ago when this data came out, but at that point they had reached 3,000 families. Um, they were trying to spread accurate public health information about the virus through loudspeakers that they would put on trucks and drive through the complex. Um, they would distribute information pamphlets and actually paint street art with public health messaging on it. 
Uh, and the activists that were doing this work have long been organizing th these kinds of, of, um, of, of uh, processes and practices. Uh, and now they're, they have to battle the military police who are trying to enforce their stay at home orders, but they keep on doing this. And Marcin says that they need solidarity. If not, we will not survive because it's not the government that's going to save our lives. And so they have historically tried to exercise this kind of solidarity and are, are reconfiguring that in the face of COVID. So what they are doing, I think, and I argue is that they are reorganizing the socio-ecologies of their neighborhoods. So they're trying to contain the movement of infectious viruses, but also increase the spread of food and of water um, in ways that will make life. And they draw on and rework long-standing forms of collective life that are safeguarding people and trying to decrease the precarity of these ecological intimacies. And we see these formalized mutual aid societies across much of the globe, including in Canada. So in Kingston here, we have mutual aid Kataraqui um, in the downtown east side. Andre Kobayashi has been writing about um, the coordinating efforts of the downtown east side response team, which you can hear more about at our SNID in February, if you are able to come to that. Uh, and these are urban practices that are inherently socio-ecological in nature and that work towards collective life. So quickly to review, um, we've been thinking about the city as a socio nature, which is a core tenant of UPE, which asks us to consider how colonial capitalist urbanization processes remake environments in ways that shift precarious intimacies, generally, but not only in ways that can compound inequality. And I thought through this through three different temporal moments, this idea of emergence, idea of transmission, idea of prevention. Um, in my own future work is going to delve a little bit more into this question of biosecurity and the impact of post-COVID biosecurity processes, how those might be increasing urban precarity. Um, but I also think it's important, while it's important to be cautious about some of these programs, it's likewise imperative to pay attention to and support the collective life-making processes that continue to recreate care ecologies in the microbiological city. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, for that very rich talk. There are so many different directions that, um, that we could go. You, it, it made me think about what you know the meaning. What just the musings? I don't know if we'll have time to talk about uh, like the concept of the individual in these times where the borders between self and other seem to be changing. Uh, you know, through climate change and the like, and and how uh, the the it seems to be calling into question. You know, the the idea of individual being separate from individual, but also individual being separate from ecology, which I think that over time with, with uh, at least on, uh, among the more privileged <clears throat> with the rise of industrialization, we increasingly see ourselves as distinct from, but I actually am uh, just musing about that and bookmarking it in case we can talk about that. And then also the second thing to talk about would be news and how mainstream media is or is not talking about things that can be done in order to slow the spread. Why are certain things not being talked about when they have to do with working conditions uh, for uh, people in blue collar jobs and, in, and transportation as you as you pointed out, but, but instead um, certain discussions are being had about um, shopping early in a grocery store, which obviously people should do if they're at risk, but that, um, th that I think would be super interesting to talk about and I'm going to start off though by talking about asking you about vaccine and I so I was your biosecurity discussion was so interesting to me when I was thinking about uh, therapeutics and the way that some um, some governmental agencies notably the governor of Texas I believe said uh, not interested in trying to slow the spread happy enough for a vaccine perhaps but very interested in in holding you know therapeutics which is a way to make a lot of money, you know, and it reminds me of like kind of high tech, high tech drugs versus the precautionary principle. If we kind of know that um, that the that poverty and the division between rich and poor creates a lot of these kinds of problems, then you know how how much should we be focusing on something like the equivalent of a precautionary principle, which would basically be equity for all, in order to decrease the need for vaccines, which seem very end of pipe to me. But that's, that's, those are my musings. I'm gonna just throw that idea of the vaccine. How does that fit into your analysis or how do, would you like to ana analyze it in a bigger picture? 
You brought up a lot of really interesting points that I think I can partly speak to, but I also know some of the participants here can maybe speak to some of them even in greater detail than I can. Um, but yeah, so like we can start with the vaccine question. I think um, vaccines are in some ways like they're easier than transforming the capitalist system within which we work, right? Of course, like equity and equitable access to infrastructure, um, to adequate shelter, like that would be, to me, that would be the most important thing. Um, but that's very, that's very difficult to realize in the neoliberal kind of capitalist economies that we live within. Whereas um, vaccines are not actually, like there's, been, there's lots of rhetoric around how difficult vaccines are to come up with. Uh, but the pharmaceutical industry is so powerful in setting, I think, the parameters of of where of where we, we locate the the fix. That in terms of like of the way that we're thinking, the vaccine is actually much simpler. It doesn't require these massive reorganizations of of our cities, of our planet, of the ways that we live, and of the ways that we interact. So in that respect, I think it's like. It, it becomes this like biomedical and technical fix that fits within this system of this pharma system of pharmacracy, which um, some anthropologists have been speaking a little bit about the the, the very uh, the um, the power that those pharmaceuticals have in delineating the trains of action on which these kinds of, of of viruses are fought, right? And I see Elaine has a question around this war rhetoric, which we can get to. Um, but I also think like thinking about vaccines in terms of political ecologies is really interesting. And this is something that I'm just starting to think a little bit about, um, but we can think about um, how different more than human worlds are involved in the creation of vaccines. So animals are often tested, right? For very early stages, not often, but they all, they are for vaccines and therapeutics. So they're drawn into this. Um, and then later stage trials or early stage human trials often involve people that are already precarious in many urban places. Um, so as I mentioned with the new international division of labor, there has been the outsourcing of different kinds of production facilities, but we've also seen the outsourcing of different pharmaceutical activities. And so there has been the outsourcing of clinical trials to places often in the global south where there is an underpaid labor force who will partake in these trials for sometimes for some money, but often just for medical treatment. That's the only way they can receive treatment. Um, they participate or these particular cities generally in the south have, have lower regulatory standards. So pharmaceutical companies are better able to, to erect their their randomized control trial there um so and and people there in in many places that pharmaceutical companies go are treatment naive which means they haven't been exposed to many pharmaceuticals in the past so so people's bodily ecologies are being brought into trying and um trying to, to eradicate these kinds of diseases and i was just reading earlier today that um, there's concern over a particular species of bird. I can't remember the name of the bird, um, but that that migrates from the southern tip of South America to the northern to to the Arctic in Canada, um, and it eats crabs in in Delaware. Um, and the crab, those crabs themselves are decreasing because they are required for vaccine trials. The blood of the, those crabs are required for testing a particular kind of endotoxin in vaccine trials. So this bird is already um, endangered and they're worried that with the heightened need for vaccines, more of these crabs will be taken, um, will be depleted of their blood. There will be more, fewer and fewer crabs that can feed the species and the species might, might go endangered. So these ecological reverberations, I think, are um, really, really important to be thinking about when we're thinking about the, the vaccine kind of fix, right? Because that's not a necessarily an equitable. Anyway, I could talk about vaccines for a really long time. I'm not an expert in it, but I'm really interested in what's going on in the vaccine world. Yeah, so to bring it back to war, it's like we're ba basically um, going to war, uh, or the, the 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 I think it's the blue those blue um, no they're a kind of they're very ancient crabs that, um, and yeah. they yes and and they just are su we're making them suffer so much because we are not we're not being good in our skin as it were so it's a kind of a almost a some kind of weird proxy war but so I'm going to bring it to Elaine's question where she thanks you for this amazing talk. And she says, Elaine Power, I wonder if I wonder if you could talk about how the language of war shapes these biosurveillance activities and how we might reconceptualize public health activities if we took seriously a post-human framework where humans are part of nature, not apart and above, not where it's like obvious that we get to kill the crabs and we get to uh, 
uh, kill the the um, the primates in order for us to um, in order for us to have vaccines, for example. Yeah, I mean, this, the language of war is so pervasive. Um, I didn't even think about it until I started reading about it. Uh, and so I think it's the language of war, but there's also been, as I mentioned, this connection between infectious disease, combating infectious disease and actually military projects. The United States government has acted, especially under the Bush administration and also under Obama, has acted as though um, infectious disease is a war to be fought and, and therefore is, or, and that war is located in, in the people who are thought to carry those kinds of infectious diseases. Uh, and I don't know. I've been. I don't know how many of you have been read uh, Neil Ahuja's piece on or his book on bioinsecurities, but he actually details this in a phenomenal way. Um, it's kind of a dense text, but he does a really good job. And he explains how, like the Bush, the war on terror, or sorry, not the war on terror, but the um, the Bush administration's declaration of war. Um, on Iraq was really premised on this idea of there being weapons of mass destruction, of which one was this concern around the smallpox virus and concern that there would be, uh, that, that Saddam Hussein had these viruses and would be unleashing it on, um, on American soil. And so, so there's the rhetoric of war, but there's also actually been the conflation of biosecurity and infectious disease concerns with actual military campaigns and, and justifications for military campaigns. Um, so there's that aspect of it. And then, yeah, like I think public health, um, public health should take its, its language more seriously and needs to think within a post-human framework. There has been this one health framework that the World Health Organization has been promoting that tries to link human health with animal health, with environmental health. Um, and so that might be one direction in which public health might go. Um, I am not an expert in that program. I'm al always a little bit skeptical about what the WHO um, promotes in terms of these like all-encompassing kinds of programs. So I don't know how those how those will be enacted, but I certainly think there are there are ways that um, public health and human health officials are trying to look at these these kinds of interconnections and, and understand that humans cannot be healthy if if the environments within which we live and the animals who, with we live are also not um, thriving in, in their ecological ways. Um, so Elaine, I don't have a direct answer for that question, um, but I do think that there are movements to doing that, but I also think that that that's an area of study, like what, what are those, uh, what are the, are the assumptions that are built into those um, into those One Health programs, I would be interested to know more about because they also they also operate within the biosecurity logic, from what little I have seen. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. And also, speaking, so Jen, Jen, you had the question about um, why aren't certain things being done, like increased affordable housing, um, access to universal basic income. And so I just want to plug Elaine's talk next week, I believe it is, because I think she's going to be able to answer some of those questions much better than I will be able to answer those questions. That's perfect. Yes. Yeah, so that'll be Craig uh, Berggold and um, George Payne and Elaine Power speaking about fixing CERB and then uh, and having having to do with with equity as well. So that's fabulous. And that'll be the that's uh, in that's the last talk for for this year. And so extra reason for people to come. So um, I well, we're out of time. Oh, we have um, Oh, let's see. I wanted to mention that I put into the chat. Uh, I put into the chat the name of the book: Bio Insecurities, Disease Interventions, Empire, and Government of Species by Neil Ahuja. Uh, and I thank everyone for attending, for your for your interest, your participation, your attention, and most particularly to Carolyn Prowse for a amazingly interesting and fruitful, productive, enriching talk uh, that gave us lots of ideas and. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for coming, everyone, and um, and take care, and and uh, and bravo, well done. <laughs> as I take from Eleanor McDonald to to all panelists. Thank bye, bye, everyone. It's nice to see friendly names in the attendees list. Thank you for coming at this time of term. Oh my gosh, it's yeah. <laughs>